Ladies and gentlemen, we are now starting with uh, part two of um, of part one, and that doesn't make any sense to those of you just tuning in. But last week we were supposed to have John Why Not on as a guest, but the interview got erased thanks to my human error. That's the only thing I can blame it on because it's the only thing that makes sense. But somehow it disappeared. So I've managed to, to grab Johnny again here now on Saturday afternoon. John's back in his home in L.A. And uh, we're going to catch up and try and sort of re recreate that little bit of lightning in a bottle that we had with part one last time. And I'm going to start it off with a very similar question, welcoming our good friend, my good friend, and hopefully your good friend later, John Wynott to the program. John is uh, an old friend of mine. We're going on about two decades worth of friends. He's done several records with me. Um, we've, uh, you know, we've just spent a lot of social time together, and he's one of my favorite people to talk to on the phone. Um John is, uh, I mean, you know, back in the early days, John played with everybody from Corey Hart through to the band and Rick Danko, Carol Pope, uh, Blackie and the Rodeo Kings. Uh, you've done albums with Dave Matthews, Lucinda Williams, Blue Rodeo, um, sound scores for um, Ronan. Um, what were some of the other ones? The Austin Power movies, The um, uh, Last of the Mohegans. Grammy winner. You've been around the world when it comes to music, John. You've done rock and roll. You've done um, you've done some sponic arrangements. Um, as a person, when I sit down and talk to you, you force me to listen to music like Arvo Parr and Rachmaninoff, uh, and really challenge my brain. Oh, sorry uh, about that. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Um, it's it's one of the things that I love about you. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, and what what I was hoping we could sort of catch on, is. Um, is the way that music has changed in your opinion. Um, you know, we are we are two humans out of millions um, living on this little rock flying through time. And we're only here for a short time. But in this short time, like this, the last hundred years, music's changed so much. Um, you know, if you go back just past the hundred years, you know, musicians were sort of non-entity people. They were people that, you know, existed for their own passion. Uh, in the last hundred years, we've taken the notion of a rock star or a musician, made them celebrities and made them into famous, rich, important, powerful people. That's a brand new thing for us. Um, how The question that I'm having these days and what I'm trying to get my head around, John, is what's the, all these changes in music that have happened, like in the last hundred years in particular, you know, it's gone from an oral tradition to a recorded medium. Um, and now the recorded medium has it's taken on a permanence um, that changes our listening experience. And we talked a little bit about that, but the biggest thing is the, the change in music and where it's come from. You know, it, it came from, like I say, the oral tradition of trying to remember a story of something that happened. And then we got into melodic and pop, you know, hooks that kind of, you know, earworms that make our brain feel good. Um, and now we're heading into a time where AI has taken over. Um, and I mean, I'm not saying AI is going to be in forever because I, I really don't think it is. I think it's going to have a place. But these are the questions that I'm wondering these days. Is like, what's happening with music and what's happening essentially with the younger generation doing music? And you being a professor at Berkeley, you are um, daily put in front of a group, a select group of young musicians who are you know, starting out their world in a place where me and you look back and go, oh my God, what's happened? And they're looking at it afresh going, oh my God, what's coming up? So like, can you kind of put that together for me from your perspective, seeing these young kids and sort of seeing how, how they're adapting to the world and what you think has changed? Um, well, that's a, that's a bit of a broad topic, but yeah, um, no problem. <laughs> so that means they'll get us talking. Like we need help talking. Like we, well, what's one of our characteristics as friends is that is that we can just say, hey, what's going on? And we'll, we we don't even bother talking about hockey. We just go directly to like philosophical shit. And I know. <laughs> a little bit of gossip here and there, but you know, anyway, we can keep it going. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's it, to me, it's, it's a, it's, I'm constantly thinking, I'm not constantly thinking about it, but I do think about what's changed and how we, uh, it, probably I think more about how we feel about the change and what, what our perceptions are of the changes. Because um, one of the things I've been kind of on lately is the idea that, However, it is when you start doing like when when I started being in recording studios or playing in bands, things were a certain way. And I mean, I know historically it's not true that I, that this is that it has always been that way. But there's a sort of in, kind of instinctive reaction to it that, oh, this is how it's always been. And so mm -hmm. I'm stepping into an existing kind of structure uh, that's relatively stable. And then along come these new things that screw it all up. And that's like. So you get a lot of that kind of, ah, the good old days, you know, and I'm not, you know, uh, just philosophically, I'm just not a believer in the good old days. 
Uh, you know, there are days. That's it. Yeah. That, um, so I kind of take it as it comes, and I, I don't get too worried about, you know, how it used to be and what what's become of that grit, the grand old tradition of what what I was doing in the eighties. You know, um, or this like I the, the first recording session I ever was at was in I think seventy six, um, wow. seventeen, and uh, it was with uh, actually Garth Richardson was there. And it would be really funny if he ever hears this. <laughs> Garth was the same age as me, I think. Um, he might have been a year younger. And he, his dad had a recording studio in, down in uh, Yorkville mm -hmm. called Schneider Re Recording. And um, I mean, he was partners with Bob Ezrin. I mean, this is, you know, we're talking the mid 70s, the 60s were still, we could still smell the 60s. They, had, they hadn't yeah. completely decomposed yet. And um, I don't know what kind of goofy thing we were doing, but I remember thinking, man, this is a really, really cool thing. Um, and I've, that's kind of the basis of my studio experience was that, you know, the, a MCI 24 track, you know, a, a J1624 track. And I don't know what the console was. It might have been a sound workshop or I don't know what they had in there, but it was something foreign to me at the time. And then there's another, some glass. And then on the other side of the glass, there's a room, has all this weird muffling stuff on the wall, mm -hmm. lots of microphones and bits of gear and stuff. And I was playing Fender Rhodes with a talk box. Fender Rhodes threw a talk box in. Like, what the hell is going on? I don't know. I can remember the tune too. It was not a very good tune written by the. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't name him because and I don't want to throw shade on him. He's a good guy. But anyway, um, and we're all high school kids, basically. And mm -hmm. um, but if I think back to that moment when, you know, mid 70s, the idea of being in an independent recording studio with 24 tracks of, of gear and a bunch of preset mics and a sort of a situation like that, where you have a facility that's designed to be versatile and to accommodate wave after wave of artists and musician, whatever. That was less than 10 years old at that time. That was not a common thing. It, uh, 10 years, 15, 20 years before that, in other words, in the blink of an eye before that, the studios were either owned by record labels and they were run by people who built them. And that, and then that that only, yeah, the guys, yeah, I mean, but just, you know, for example, like, I mean, there's a couple of a bigger, more famous facilities and stuff like that. Bill Putnam had built some stuff, but he built his shit in the early 60s. So it's 15 years before that, you know? You think, man, oh, that old, the, the grand old, you know, uh, classic room that is now East West Studios that was United Western at one point. And then, and I mean, they're not that old. So yeah. like we think of it as a long tradition. It's not, there are no long traditions. We go, we do everything really quick and technology. The other thing also is like, I, I think about also that kind of retrospective feeling that people have because um, they're thinking, man, that was so cool when Led Zeppelin came out and you know, it's so much less cool now. Like we're, we're just geeks now. Boy, those guys were super cool. And uh, which, by the way, you know, I, I don't know them very well. I don't really know them at all, but I think it's debatable how cool they were. But they were just, they were doing their, I mean, they, they made incredible records. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so people are like, well, we want to go, we want to record on a one inch eight track. We want a Helios console. We want the same microphones, et cetera. And I, I can pretty much guarantee you that they were not thinking that way. They were not going, you know, this modern recording here in 1968 is just, it's kind of cheesy and crappy. We want to go back to the really old school stuff, that the stuff that was <laughs> back 50 years ago, which is 1918, which was like mechanical recording direct. I mean, they weren't thinking yeah. that. They were trying to be as modern as they could be. And that's so that's one of the things that sort of changed this idea that, that there's this long history. It's not very long. No. And... They were, I mean, the gear they had was fine. It was good stuff, but but it doesn't mean that because, you know what I mean? It's not, that that wasn't what made them cool either. It was like, they recorded with the best gear they had. If they had had 14 SM57s at Mackie 8 bus and two ADATs, they probably would have been able to make Led Zeppelin 1. Yeah. That uh, might have been a bit of a challenge for Eddie, but I think they would have figured it out. And what would have mattered was what the group was doing and how that how that worked in the culture, you know? That stuff is the same, you know, the and the relationship also with the audience, I think, is in a lot of ways the same. There's a few things that are different, but there's subtleties and they're they are all transitory. So another one is another one of these concepts, like the, the idea of owning the music, like I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to buy this 12 inch hunk of PVC that's in a custom made box, mm -hmm. for, you know, with artwork on it or a photograph or something. And I'm going to take it home. And as long as I don't scratch it too badly, it will be mine. And, and um and that was that idea 
is a 20th century idea. Never existed yeah. before that. If you wanted to buy a piece of music, you bought it on it that was printed. And your playback system was you and your fingers and your ability to read and play music or your friends. If That's you right. wanted your music, you had to go where the musicians were. And that magic trick of being able to record it so that you could disconnect it from the moment and disconnect it from the geographic location and go somewhere else, you know, to get a recording of Hoagie Carmichael. And then you could be on a boat, a, a naval boat in the harbor at Plymouth in the UK. You could be a Canadian naval person mm. and have this little Victrola and you could stick your Glenn Miller record on there or your Hoagie Carmichael yeah. record on there. And it wouldn't sound the same, but it would invoke the experience. And part of that was just the actual noise coming at you and the song and the idea and the cleverness of it. But the other, the other part of it was there's a sort of technological shift in our consciousness where we we can remove things from the original event and have something symbolic of it. And then in a way we relive it, but we don't relive it as if we're there. We're not hallucinating. We don't think, man, look inside the box. Where are those musicians? Like we're, we're never fooled like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but you know, you'd be surprised how people assume that the idea behind recording is to have the same experience happen later on your speakers. It's not the same. It's symbolic of the experience. You're creating symbolism the same way storytelling is. Anyway, so I, I went kind of way off the deep end. Oh, no, that's good. Actually, I like where you're going. That's good. yeah. What I'm what I'm saying is that it's not. It's it's different in some ways, but a lot of the stuff that 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 connects with audiences is the same stuff that connected with audiences when recording first happened, and the big technological development, uh, I think, was the notion of of storing a, a something that plays back in time like music and being able to move it someplace and being able to play it later along with the notion of the, the simpler version of that which is radio which which would break the geographic connection but then you still be hearing stuff in the moment and that took getting used to people had to figure that out but it didn't take very long people adapt to this stuff really really quickly especially if other people are doing the same thing so to me that's really interesting and um and uh, it's still the same connection. You're still trying to invoke the idea of the whatever is expressed in the music later and somewhere else. That's it. And so, how is it different with streaming? Well, there's a we have, I think, a slightly less physical connection to it because we don't own it. Yeah. So, um, I don't know if you. I mean, you you for sure made mixtapes for people. You might still do that. I don't know. Um, I I haven't in a while, but yeah. <laughs> it's not the same as making a playlist for somebody. Um, no, the, the playlist is first of all, it's much faster, much more efficient. Woo, yay! More time, more time to surf TikTok. Yeah, but also it's less, it's less intimate. Is this a big mm -hmm. problem? No, it's just the next thing. I don't think it's a big problem. Um, it's true. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you decide when you're born, this is it. We are at the perfect moment in history. We've reached the peak of our experience. Everything about technology, culture, human existence is now. Is, has gotten as good as it can get. And from now on, it's all downhill. There's a lot of people who think that way. And I, I just don't, because it doesn't I, I've, I've gotten the history. No. Yeah, I've, 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 got, I've been guilty of it. You know, I've been guilty of it at times. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm aware enough to knock myself out of it, but there's been times where it's like, oh man, that was such a great time. Why can't things be like that? And, blah, blah, blah. and I mean, there's two parts to it. A, you know, this time is just as good as that time. It's just, I'm in a different mood. And B, that time had a lot of shit too. I just chose to forget about it. You know, yeah. uh, history is a great filter. So like, I'm having uh, so much garbage in the top 100. Well, believe me, there was garbage in the top 100 in the 60s and the 50s. Oh yeah. And um, we just don't we just don't continue to play it. The stuff that we now play after all this time is the stuff that history has filtered out for us, and we we kind of have that benefit of hindsight. And one of the amazing things about art is that great art changes you and. The greatest art changes you and reveals yourself to you. It shows you how your consciousness works. That's that's one of my operating theories of what, what is art. Oh, um, okay. And uh film is great for that because it'll actually it'll actually it actually shows us how we think, how we track a story is built into how the actual medium works. Right. And that's modern enough that we can see it, which to me is amazing. Um so I'm a total, you know, I'm a freak for this stuff. And I try and tell 20 year olds this stuff, and they're like, okay, Mr. Magoo, like what are you talking about? Well, they don't. They, they don't have Mr. Magoo as a as a cultural landmark because they don't know who Mr. Magoo was. Like I, you know, people say, "Oh yeah, well, we with studios, we had to build stuff. You know, I had to, I had to hack together cables, so I had to become MacGyver." They're like, they don't know who MacGyver was. Right. It's too far back in history. <laughs> so, 
but I'll, but anyway, I, so it's the whole, you know, come unstuck in time, Billy Pilgrim, what's going on? How's the world falling apart? It's nothing like it was. I don't understand it. This is just normal. This is how humans are when they get older. And if they have the privilege to live long enough, it all looks foreign and weird. And yeah. that's fine. It's not a sign that things are foreign and weird, particularly. Yes. Maybe, but that's not the sign. The, you know, that's not the indicator. Um, so I feel good about that. I also hang around 20-year-olds. Um, yeah, who, tell me, tell me a little bit about that. So you're working at you're working at Berkeley. Yeah, you have got a class of. Um, like I don't go to like the the park where they're playing and hang around. I mean, I have no. a where, they, <laughs> where they show up, you know. Um, but you've got a group of you've got a select group of kids. Uh, so so Berkeley is has a very small um, yearly admittance or semester admittance. It's quite pricey. Um, it's not exclusive per se, but it's it's not a it's not a you know it's not a college with thousands of kids coming through you. You're you're getting pretty close to these kids. Um, talk a little bit about that experience if if you to try and sort of shed light on this. Like the kids, I'm I'm really fascinated with. Like I remember when I when I decided I wanted to play music. You know, my parents were like, "Okay, you can play music or you can go to school, but you know, you 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 can't do both. And depending on which you choose, you have a place to live." So I packed up my bass guitar and went and moved out and moved in with a friend. Um, and that was the end of my my family experience with my with my um, with my family having any say in my music career. I was going to play music. I was a Newfoundlander. I liked punk rock music. Um, I had no teaching in my you know, I'd never had a teacher. I barely knew scales, but I just knew I wanted to do this. And I set out, you know, with 60 bucks in my pocket and one change of clothes, and I moved halfway across the country and I slugged it out and slugged it out and slugged it out. And I'm 55 years old. And I'm still slugging it out, even though I've been luckier than a lot of people. Um, I know my reasons for continuing to do music, but it seems like the kids nowadays, even in light of, you know, there's no music, it's too rapidly changing. Everything is the same. It's all Spotify and YouTube. There's still kids who are like, that's okay. I'm going to do that. And that's the kids that you're seeing. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah. Um, yeah. Berkeley is an interesting place. First of all, people know about it um, mm. and particularly musicians know about it. And it is a specialty school. There are some sort of neighboring specialties there too, but it's absolutely a music school. And by comparison, um, my house in LA is just down the road from a place called USC, which is a great music school and a great film music school, a great film school, et cetera. And um, Hey, <laughs> You see the door open. Oh yeah, it's just very like that. Somebody tomorrow. peeked in. It's all good. And um, and we may get a visitor, but uh, that That's was okay. yeah, it'd be fine. Um, uh, but USC, which has all that stuff, I was talking to a friend of mine who was working there, and he said, "Yeah, it's cool, but you know, the difference is, is that Berkeley doesn't have a has a foot. Berkeley does not have a football team. They don't have a medical school. They don't have a law school, um, etc." I mean, I'm. I'm short selling USC. It's 10, probably 10, 20. I don't even know how many people are at USC, but it's many times the size of Berkeley. Berkeley is a small college. It's not that exclusive, but there's a built-in exclusivity in the cost. Boston's expensive. Right. Uh, it's a private school. Uh, there's a lot of facilities there. Living there is expensive. You, 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 if you're going to go there without some kind of scholarship or other kind of ride in there, it's going to cost you. A lot of money. Um, it's a big deal. And uh, my personal feeling is I actually think the idea of, of trying to, you know, make it a richer kind of more of a exclusive exclusive kind of a experience, I think is wrong. I think they should they should be lowering the bars as much as possible. And to a certain extent, the philosophy of that school is is pointed towards that. But of course, there's you know you they, you want to they still are considered by some to be the best in the world, and that's a debatable point. I think they're really good, but you know there are things about a college that are just sort of weird. But anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, they, it was weird. They hired me at almost like almost random. I was just sort of poking around, and I interfaced with somebody on this thing called the Facebook. You might have heard of it. it was, oh yeah, yeah. Was it? It was like oh, my only, only. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I, it's still around. I actually was off of it for a long time at the at the advice of our our mutual friend Jake. Uh, he Jake, said, that, Jake said, "Hey, let's. You should deactivate that. Your life will get better." And you know what? He was right. Anyway. Yeah, back, a long story. Don't want to get there, but anyway. Um, so the population I have in front of me is exclusive in a way, partly because they were inspired to seek that place out. And if you seek it out and you can figure out the the money you're in, it's like there are auditions and stuff, but they're they're flexible. They don't you don't have to read music. You don't have to. It depends who you are. So if you come there saying I want to be a 
virtuosic guitarist, they're going to expect that you're going to learn how to read or at least figure out yeah. some substitute for that. So there, I mean, it's definitely, there's some of that, but the department that I teach in is music production engineering, and that is selective. The, ma the major is selective. It's competitive and people have to, they, they're there for two semesters and then they apply for it and they have to convince us. Mm. And, and I'm on the committee that, that picks these people. And so, uh, and that's all, that's fascinating because the people from all over the world are doing this. And um, so the population that's in front of me, and I tend to teach seniors. I don't, I'm not that involved in the kind of in, in incoming part of it. I'm not doing the sort of early technical stuff. It's just, that's just random. I'm, I could do that stuff, but it's just, I'm mm -hmm. stuck usually with kids who are about to graduate. And I say kids, they're fully adults. They're, they're yeah. usually in their early twenties. And um, so they're, they're almost adults. <laughs> it's not a cross section of the population. I don't think, I mean, I don't know because I don't know the cross section of the population, but it's not, I think it's likely skewed in some directions, both. I think culturally the idea that they're focused on music also, I think just in terms of intellectually, I think they're pursuing things that are a little bit more long-term and a little bit more, most of them are thinking like artists and thinking like on that kind of heavy sort of adult scale. Like they're really trying to work this stuff out. So they're cool. And, but they're 20. They're, they're, mm -hmm. younger than, they're like the, the, the fresh young end of Gen Z. Yeah. You know, several generations removed from me. And so it's really interesting to kind of, first of all, to try and understand how they see the culture mm -hmm. and, and what are they looking for? and what they pick up on and they never disappoint uh you know, they're not all great students but they're generally speaking the, the the level of discourse is amazing and if i get them interested in and we get talking about the cultural side of things the you know they of course they're out of college they want to figure out what all this stuff does they want to learn the things yeah uh, and i'm that's cool with me but i'm not that interested i'm less interested in the things i'm more interested in broader concepts and so if I poke them enough and tell enough jokes and kind of get them engaged, they actually are. They're totally there. They're, it's amazing. They're, they're thinking on, on intellectual levels. They may not be well-read particularly because they might, they're this kind of specialist in, in what they're doing, but, right. but they, what they, what they're into, they know, and they have lots of knowledge and they get deep into it and they work really hard to try and, you know, they're trying to be there for three or four years and get out with some kind of idea, something that they can turn into a business or whatever. And they're all in. You know, they're just like I was, just like you were probably. Well, I mean, you just told the story of how you were, just like we were. We yeah. were told that it was a bad idea to be a musician. Well, the entire culture is telling them that now. You know, like, yeah. I and mean, I think the entire culture was telling us that too, probably. Um, I think so. Just... Well, you know, so guitar is all right, John. You can't make a living out of it. Yeah. Know? And I mean, that's generally true. You know, it's it's a yeah. select few that can do it. And, you know, I've been very fortunate and, and um, I didn't over, you know, I mean, I can make my resume sound good. Would you? So can, you can make my resume sound pretty good too. You just did that quite yep. well. But, <laughs> but I, it's not that notable. It's good enough. It keeps me going. I'm still into it, mm -hmm. um, and I'm still challenged. But anyway, I saw, I sort of axed, backed into this gig. I was 55 years old, and I said, you know, one thing led to another. A couple of conversations, a meeting, a presentation, all improvised by me. No plan. Just right. kept saying, well, "Would you be interested in this?" I'm like, "I don't know. I'll give it a shot." It's, just weird enough it could be kind of cool literally it yeah um, and then it turned out we were very simpatico and one of the thing that attracted me to the place was um apart from the the marquee value of it uh what really attracted me was the other people there that were teaching already i didn't know the students yeah. they, they, i didn't have much experience with people 30 40 years younger than me so um but i figured i'll find out <laughs> you know but the mm. people that were working there were really cool they were and they were they thought like I did. They were, they were, uh, I don't mean necessarily philosophically or politically, but they were digging in the same way that I've been digging. They're looking for the bigger truths and and they're finding it fascinating still. And I still do find it fascinating, including the top 100 on Billboard. I'm interested in that stuff. Yeah. It's not the same. It does. It isn't static. It's completely, it's, it's like a stampede of craziness. All sorts of different things go on there. Do I listen to it? Do I care about it? Do I relate to the topics? No, I don't. Yeah. Most of the songs are about trying to get laid in a bar. Yeah. And that's just not something I'm doing. They've so, been singing songs about getting laid in a bar for fucking as long as I can remember. Yeah. You know, and I mean, that's, that's also men, that's men are, what people they're, between 19 and 30 try and do, you know? Oh yeah. And if it's men writing it, they're writing about what the way, the way women look. Exactly. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's like, well, that's that. kind of shallow. It might be shallow, but it's wired into our, our, you know, species or whatever, or any species. I don't know. Anyway, but but fine. I don't relate to it like that. But I hear I hear the creativity of it, and it's high end. There's a lot yeah. of work that goes into this stuff. It doesn't always nail me in, in the terms of the way the way Rachmaninoff might. Although once in a while, I hear something amazing, and not everybody agrees yeah, with yeah. it. You know, there was there's a Cardi B song that I think is fantastic, and I was like, I absolutely relate to it. Um, uh, which I think it's called be care. I think it's called careful or be careful with me. It's like, and it's just a cheesy little pop song, but man, it's really good. It's really expressive, and it's like, and it's funny, and it's uh, but heartfelt. Like it's it's also serious. You know, I'm like okay, <laughs> like I interesting. Just, I hate this. You know, <laughs> I have to be a little careful about loving it because it, it can kind of ruin it for a 20 year old if a 64 year old person goes, "That's great." You know, they're like, "Oh shit!" Oh, yeah, exactly. Damn. And the, old, the old Lemmy <laughs> thing, you know, like if you remember what Lemmy saying about rock, rock music. The idea is to make music that your parents hate. And oh yeah. So anyway, so I mean, what? Now they're not all wired to the to the top 40 either. They're or top 100 either. They they have their various things that they love and they're trying to turn into music and trying to figure out how to make business out of it and stuff. So they're exploring, but they're they're all in. They're not they're not uh, the callow youth myth. It it may exist. It doesn't show up in my classrooms at all. The people that show up in front of me are serious. And they're there. I, they're ready to go. And yeah, they're challenging. I wake up in the morning going, I got to bring some game here because they're yeah. they can totally step around me. They're really smart, and it's the cure for that kind of gray haired pessimism people that, have. That I just through combination of randomness being available having a slightly service oriented mindset which is i haven't always had but definitely have it now mm -hmm. i got through an accident i got this call from berkeley to come and teach and i said yes and i i didn't say yes right away i thought about it because i thought what the hell am i doing there i don't but i was i had a chat with a friend of mine and he said you, you don't say no to this if it doesn't work in two years go back and tell everybody the stories of it and i mean he was right and i was 55 years old and i became uh I, you know entry level educator and i still feel like that's that's been nine years and i still feel that way uh and it's nerve-wracking um and fear-provoking but man what a gift that is yeah like people are i'm 64 and i'm i'm still thinking about the next 10 years of work and um and i i'm not thinking of it i mean partly because you know my mom lived until she was 98 i better make some dough um because <laughs> if i just stop now i won't have enough but i mean so okay yeah. um but the beautiful thing is it's the challenge is what floats my boat and it's and it's not always 100 percent. it's not like i'm not skipping through the daisies every day but but it's um it's it's a fantastic gift to find something that i can't do that they want me to do they want yeah. what I got. they want me to get better at it they'll help me get better at it and then also the students who are there are investing in it you know so the, my alarm goes off in the morning and my wake up going holy shit i have to bring these people something valuable and you and do they are not smart. dumb they're smarter than me so i gotta i can't really fake it i mean i am sort of faking it but i can't you know uh, so i mean if you want my idea of uh i mean this is not what i was planning to do you know i'm not mm -hmm. sure what i was planning to do but it involved being a rock star i think but video killed the radio star there pretty good but um well but, but how, just, how cool at, at, at you know 64 years old to be uh you know i mean jesus christ living the dream is um you know th there are some of us who have lucked out um i consider myself amongst them too John, thank you so much for taking your time uh twice now <laughs> to, uh, to chat on the show um and of course you know i mean thank you for for hanging out with me as, as we do every now and again um Ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is John Wynott. He's a old friend. He's a he is a, a musician who has been in the business for as as long as anybody I know, and uh, he has hit through every angle. And at the end of the day, uh, I mean, what I'm taking from you, John, is that the kids are as eager to do it as we were, you know. And and as much as we had everything stacked against us, they have everything stacked against them too. But they're still going to find a way to do it. They're still going to find a way to get out and and make their noise in a room with other people. And I think that that's I think that's what is going to keep it alive myself. I think the live thing is, is that connection between humanity is what we're looking for um, in, in most everything. Um, and I think that music is a really good example of that. You know, you can share, 
you can share life experiences, you can share philosophies, you can share political activism, uh, whatever you want. And um, it, it's it's good to hear that the kids are still doing it. You know, I mean, I see it in my kids, but it's good to hear from a... Hey. hey. <laughs> cool. Back again. I mean, yeah. You know, the first mix I did in a studio, I was 17, I think, or something like that. So just let's, that's, it was, yes, it was 70, no, it was probably 77. Wow. So 46 years since then. Uh, so I'd like to think, and I don't know, I mean, I, how many records have I mixed? I don't know, like a bunch, but yeah. um, um, I've done lots of film score mixing and a film score, feature film score might have 50 pieces of music in it. Mm -hmm. So I've done, I don't know, many dozens of score of fil feature films and you know, a dozen or two, like a few dozen series and the series will have 10 episodes or 26 episodes and each one of them will have, I mean, so the number of mixes gets into the thousands and there's just no way. I, I hated this when I was in my twenties, man, people would say, Oh, it's just, just experience. And I'm like, ah, shut up old timer. Well, I don't want the old timer. And you know what? There's experience helps. And if I haven't figured out how to mix by now, I never will. So, uh, you know, I think I, I can mix, I mix. Okay. But when I listen to my, my own work, I think, ah, you know, <laughs> as one does, which is, I guess why I'm still studying it, why I'm still pushing on it. But the one thing that I, that I do caution young musicians is, you know, unless you want to get into the business of music, there's so much out there. I hear all these young musicians, they, they start talking to me, these 20 year olds and the, and within, within a, a couple of minutes of conversing the numbers, the, the conversation starts turning to numbers and algorithms and all of this other stuff. And I just say like, we're talking about like we were getting together to have lunch about songwriting and art and all of a sudden all you're talking to me about is numbers and algorithms and it i find that that's a really dangerous thing for people um yeah but you know it was going on when we were kids too because they were talking then about i you know i totally hear what you're saying and I, it's because we have fear in our inside that we won't make it and it's our drive to survive it tells us we better get our act together so if we're paying attention to where the fruit might be, you know, yeah, and, um, this is natural, but uh, it's hard to do that at the same time as you make art. We were told the same thing. You need to pursue interest from labels. You right. Need, you need to play the game. You need to have a package. Remember that you need yep. a package. Um, and or if you're a balding man like me, you need hair like they used to tell me I needed hair. I'm like, I fucking don't have hair, bro. <laughs> it's not any place you want to see it. And uh <laughs> And, and, you know, and there were people who, who could make that work, but it was always mm. kind of temporary um, with a few, very few exceptions, but mostly it was temporary. Like you'd hear about this guy, somebody got a big deal and they, you know, the record company gave them a six figure deal or a million dollars or whatever. And you think, and when you're 20, you think, well, that's it. You make a million dollars. You're good for life. Well, turns out you're not. Turns out you need to have something to do all the time. And it turns out that the actual thing that pays the rent the actual source of the money is the audience. That's right. it. If you are focused there, then you got a shot. But it's you know you have to eat. They're yeah. not gonna just knock on your door. So that's the same now. People are talking about it's. It, I get why they're talking about it. It's not that they're bad. It's just that it's very tempting to think, well, if there's a way I could work this so that I could squeeze a little money out ahead of time, right? We'll get a little advance. We're sort of colored by the idea that that there was a reliable source of money. That was some amorphous thing out there that came through the record labels. And so we would look at the labels and the agents and the managers and lawyers and so forth as being the people we were focused on. And that was, I think, a mistake. I think so you can say, hey, you know, uh, the Internet file sharing ruined music. Um, I actually don't think it did. I think I, I think a bunch of things happened to that that took the money out of the retail side of music. At least the record business, even though it it wasn't a very robust business anyway. There was it's been right. around not that long, and you know people didn't. We always thought this is the thing they need, and they they bought it because they liked it. But people yeah. were fickle; they buy what they like. And the idea that it was like any other product is also untrue. You need a fridge, you need you need to pay your heating bill, you need food. Yeah. You don't music. You you buy it what when you want it whether you need it or not you don't budget nobody i've ever heard of ever thinks well i have exactly 14 dollars this week to spend on musical entertainment and you're competing for that 14 dollars with the other rock band that was yeah. the way they talked that was nonsense if, if if you were good and you connected with the audience they found the money for you that was yeah. it that's still true so the question is how do they get it to you 
you know, right. and generally speaking, the, the, there's a couple of ways. And the main way is live performance and then and then merch. And people mm-hmm. show up at, gig, at gigs in order to show their support for you. Yeah. That's why they do it. I think that's, I mean, some people want to go and have a concert and, and enjoy the music, but mostly they want to see the other people. They want to get in a crowd and they want to show their love for the artist because you've done something for them on an artistic yeah. level. And that's very different from the kind of image that we have of the business and how it works, the transaction. So I get the privilege privilege of giving that rant to 20 year olds and it goes right by them. Just like everything went right by me. <laughs> by the way, kids, mastering your own mixes is a terrible idea. <laughs> if you mix the record, you are the last person on earth who should master it. That's just my personal opinion. But okay, right. mixing and mastering is like one word. It's like, it should not be one word. Now, <laughs> making it louder so it, you can't afford mastering, fine. Make it louder so it'll be loud enough. It'll be at the right luffs level for, for Spotify. Sure, put a limiter on it, make it better. But don't screw around with mastering. <laughs> Get someone who, who's not, you know, preferably someone with some experience, some experience and somebody who didn't mix a record. Um, yeah. Those are the, that's going to be the best thing. A real eye opener for me was was uh, a long time ago was uh, was Lady Gaga. If you imagine Lady Gaga a long time ago, when she was basically a, a pop star, like a sort of new new version of Madonna, Madonna V two. Yep. yep. And um, I thought she had some more qualities than Madonna, but you know, Madonna had her qualities. She did some stuff that absolutely was influential, and you know, my hats off to her. And I, I'm just not into dissing people for things that they do. I think whatever, you know. Yeah. I don't have to like it, but. The uh, I you know I saw the name of this person and I heard the song Poker Face, which I thought was funny because mm-hmm. I was pretty sure that there was a sort of uh, subtle innuendo there. <laughs> about, and it turns out I was right. Like she later on said, "Yep, oh yeah, I was trying to, <laughs> I was trying to make this like teenage joke," you know. Yep. And but I thought, okay, I kind of like that. But I I was like, ah, you know, man, this is pretty fluffy, lightweight stuff. And then one night I was downtown in LA near the, the, what was called the Staples Center then. And one of her shows got out and these little 14 year old kids were coming out and they were blown away. They were absolutely freaking out. They're like, no, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. I'm like, okay, this is somebody who's doing something good. Yeah. And that's the, those are the people, that's the audience that you don't have to have 20,000 of them. But if you are, it's like, it's always been true. If you ask an a r guy, what's the artist you want to sign? The artist they want to sign isn't one they like, although they did sign people they liked yep. back when they were doing that stuff. But if you wanted to get signed, the best thing you could possibly do would be to play a gig at the Horseshoe, and during the gig, everybody's standing on the table screaming. Yep. If you're doing that, the thing that A&R people can't do is get people on the tables yeah. to scream. And they know this. If you, you can skip all the figuring out your lawyers and doing all the Donald Passman shit. You can skip all that if you focus on the people and say, we want to move them out of their environment. We want to bring them something beautiful. And I thought, first of all, my my impression of of Lady Gaga back in the day, and my current impression of say Taylor Swift is that that whatever the overall transaction is and the n- numbers, she's bringing something. They're bringing something to the audience and giving it to them, and they come out feeling like they got it. Yeah, they got something. They feel like they've been the beneficiaries of some generosity to it. This is another thing that happens too. Somebody gets a hit. Getting a hit means you've written something people understand. You've, it's produced it. You haven't you haven't prevented it from being produced well. You know, which is one of the things yep. artists do. They get in the way. They you know, uh, everything lined up well and it worked out great. Uh, if you have one hit, you are not an expert. Mm-hmm. You are just you are there long enough that good fortune smiled upon you. People and aren't so- discerning. They don't go to hear good sound. They they go because they love the the musicians. They want to show their love and it's. You, you don't get the same love connection from watching it on us like listening to it on spotify and um you get the musical connection you get the content or some reasonable facsimile of it but it's um because you're not invested in it because you don't have a package in your hand uh yep. people i think long for another connection i think that TikTok actually does that at least at a certain level but what about when they take these world-class musicians and they put them in a subway and they have them play something that they performed you know the night before for an audience of you know, 2000 people at a gala dinner somewhere and they put them in a subway and, and everybody just walks by and nobody even really, you know, a few people stop and notice. Um, is that because the people are just not thinking about it? You know, they're not, they're not, it hasn't been pointed out to them that it's good. Uh, no, I think, I think, I mean, who knows, but I mean, uh, my feeling about that is that uh, there's more going on than just the player playing the notes. So 
a lot of it has to do with with uh, the circumstances and where what's going on. And um, like, um, I don't love going to rock shows. Uh, mm -hmm. If I go to a rock show, it's usually because I know somebody <laughs> in the band. Um, once in a while, somebody will offer me. I was offered tickets to go see Tedeschi Trucks. And I didn't want to go because it was at the Garden here in Boston. And I just didn't want to be in a hockey rink listening right. to a loud band. I just, it just doesn't sound like a good time to me. But had I gone, what would have floated my boat would have been, probably would have been the audience. And mm -hmm. the same is true. I mean, I go to baseball games and uh, I'm a bad baseball fan because I don't hate anybody. You know, you're supposed to be partisan. And I think that's part of the fun. There's a kind of the in-group, out-group thing. The humans do this. That's, you know, part of our instinct. And we feel good about that. Unfortunately, it leads to death and destruction sometimes too. But <laughs> but uh not a baseball game necessarily but you know for i like to root for like whatever team is like in baseball or something whatever team is losing and if well, it's football i root for whoever yeah. has the ball <laughs> yeah yeah well i just think it's i i i think uh, that particular style of athletics is is beautiful to me and i like the fact that there's a sort of not that much of a time limit and so there's a kind of um there's a depth to it and a lot of people see it and they go this is just boring you know i get that too but but the thing is, and I was at a game at Fenway Park, which is a particularly cool place to see a game. Uh, and it was the Dodgers. It was a team I know really well. Mm -hmm. And the Dodgers team had a bunch of people on it that were formerly with the Red Sox. And there was some butthurt feeling about how the Dodgers had gotten these guys, much loved players and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, vice versa. There was some old, ex, you know, whatever. There was, it was people. And so I went thinking I would just watch a ball game. And what I saw was this, this really kind of rich feeling of um, connection and love from the from 25,000 people. That was interesting to me, watching the people react and see, seeing this kind of, you know, the kind of zeitgeist out in the open like that. So there was a ball game, click, bang, you know, the Dodgers lost, whatever, you know. There was, a, there was numbers, there was a result, there were hits, there were, you know, there was action. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic, but the, the field for me, the, me the message was the bigger message, which is the circumstance, situation got all these people together and there was a good vibe. I just really enjoyed the fact that the vibes were good. When you get that many people together and the vibes are good, it's actually really fun. The problem is of course that you can also get 25,000 people in a place and have a really bad vibe. Um, but uh, it's preferable to have the good vibe, but in a way that the, the, the subway musician, you know, Joshua Bell is playing some Vivaldi or something in a subway. Um, you have a completely different audience. It's mm -hmm. a different circumstance. Everybody in there is not hanging out. They're like, did you hang out in the subway station? They're on their way somewhere. Yeah. If you're not busking, you're not hanging out. Yeah. Um, so there will be some people who will who will recognize it for what it is, even though it's taken out of context. Mm -hmm. most, people, most people won't. It's not a comment on the people. They're just in, you know, there's more to it than just the notes and the players. There's a there's this this the idea of what a concert is like and what, okay, we're gonna do the music thing now. We're gonna go where the music is and it's gonna happen. There's a connection that happens there as part, it's part of an arrangement you've made. It's kind of a I think, social yeah. compact and you take that away and some of it's going to be gone and it might develop. It might sort of happen. I bet it would be different if you had Josh Bell in a subway station and then you also brought 75 people yeah. to stand around him. That would be quite different because people it recognize this. The entire dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. And they'd be like, oh, there's something happening and yeah. they'll get interested. They want to be in the in, in the in group and check it out. They, you know, there's part of there's something that you're right that's another part of the entire thing is the package and i'm i'm hopeful that that is what's going to keep you know music alive um, okay. um well ladies and gentlemen uh we've had john why not with us for the last i don't know how long this is going to be once i cut it up but he's been here chatting for a while i actually uh, think that i will now say this is probably the end of two weeks that we're going to have john why not on because it's been a great <laughs> chat so we'll spread it out over a couple weeks i'm so sorry folks You'll, no no it's uh, you know, it. It. Just, just hang in there man it's it's you know it's wednesday night we get together we get high the band plays some music i talk to some friends people like to see it it's fun uh, it. john it's been great chatting with you man you're looking great i love the uh the letterman look i think it's um uh, i think it's fantastic i can't believe that the letterman look is a term that i just made up being used yeah. by everybody just started with right here with me but yeah i get that i get uh the walt, walt whitman which is okay Oh yeah, August Renoir, not quite right, um, and Santa Claus, which uh, you know, okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. If I didn't have rosy cheeks and twinkly eyes, it wouldn't work. But <laughs> <laughs> my wife told me that I was like, God damn it, this is dark, <laughs> you know.
twinkly eye. Rosie, get the hell out of here. <laughs> well, John, thank you very much for coming on the show, man. It's been great. Thank um, you. It's a real pleasure. You. And I, I look forward to when our paths cross again. I don't know when that'll be in person, but in the meantime, we'll continue our regular conversations on the telephone once every uh, few months. That sounds good to me. And uh, be well. And thanks a lot. It's just great. I love, I love you know, we, we have fun chatting. So we do. We certainly do.